When in 1999, the body of a beautiful 34-year-old model and celebrity bartender was found lying on the floor of the fancy Tamarind Court restaurant in Mehrauli of New Delhi with a clear bullet wound to her head, her family and the cops thought this was an open and shut case. This was a party of more than 300 people after all. Someone had to have seen something. Someone will come forward. There should have been no dearth of evidence in the case at all. And seven years after the crime, the verdict was out. The Times of India printed the verdict on the front page of their February 22nd, 2006 paper. No one killed Jessica. This is the story of that night in 1999 when Jessica Lal was killed. Yet somehow, nobody killed her. This is the story of Jessica Lal. Hi everyone, welcome to Desi Crime, a show where we dive deep into some of the craziest cases from around South Asia. I'm your host Ashwarya. And I'm Aryan. And the case I have for you today is one that shook Delhi's high society to its core back when it happened. Aryan, watch the Jessica Lal movie is something you have yeah. said to me a bajillion yeah. times and much like many of her recommendations, because she gives so many, uh, I've, I've not watched it yet, but yeah. this case... My mum recounts as one of those cases that shook Delhi and yeah, we, we lived there absolutely. when it happened. So tell us more about it. Let's go. Before the story begins though, we want to thank India Today writers Ramesh Vinayak and Vijay Jang Thapa, whose reporting on this case in 1999 proved to be invaluable for this episode. For this story, we are going back to the year 1999 in New Delhi. A swanky new restaurant had opened up called the Tamarind Court, located inside kind of an old haveli which was called the Kutub Colonnade. From all of the restaurants in the Kutub Colonnade Haveli, there was the beautiful view of the Kutub Minar, a view that even today makes the restaurants in that vicinity a hot spot for Delhi's rich and young alike. The Tamarind Court restaurant was owned by famous socialite and entrepreneur Bina Ramani, who was the quintessential representation of Delhi's high society. Perhaps a lot of our listeners are too young to know this woman or of her significance, but here is how the tabloids of the time describe Ramani. Quote, before Bina, there was no figure in Indian society circles, with perhaps the exception of Maharani Gayatri Devi, who was ever known internationally. End quote. In fact, for all you Delhiites, it is Ramani who is credited with discovering and setting up the horse cars village, another one of Delhi's luxury hotspots. But Ramani was by no means uncontroversial. Her ties to people like Daud Ibrahim and her friendships with controversial people like Tantrik Chandra Swami was just the beginning of what seemed like an incredibly shady life. You know, often we come across uh, cases and people whenever it is high society crime, right? If yeah. it's Bollywood crime or the elite, you know, crime involved were there. And once the crime has occurred, people can find connections to yeah. uh, the underworld yeah. and then relate that to one's criminality. Sure. The only sort of, you know, constraint I would like an asterisk I'd put is when you get to that level, mm -hmm. either financially or from a perspective of popularity, sure. there, these connections are sometimes inevitable because the circles become so intertwined. That's not to say that you're friends with Daud Ibrahim or yeah. something. But at that level, the, just the circles tend to be intertwined. So like you can make a connection. A small example being, mm -hmm. you know, Jeffrey uh, Epstein yeah. is yeah. the, you know, in America. And you see some of these professors. I am not talking about uh, Hawking. Stephen but Hawking, I'm saying yeah. like the Steven Pinkers and all their professors yeah. at yeah. Harvard. Um, even Huberman, you know, the famous podcaster. Yeah. Because this guy was funding science, they happen to be in the vicinity. And so people make these Those. spurious claims. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm no, just, I just agree with that. I completely completely agree with that. I think the point here is just that once you do get intertwined with those circles, then mm. then it's not an unjustifiable claim that your chances of being involved in shady situations sure, is more. Sure. And you, yes, you're involved in those circles because you're just simply that famous. Yeah. But then your chances of 
engaging in shady activity I, just by I fully agree I just want to note yeah. all I want to note was that you you're not intentionally yeah, wanting no, to meet enough. those people in yeah. all cases yeah Ramani came from wealth but had no access to her family fortune. She created it for herself after her divorce from her husband, at the time of which she was an Air India employee in New York. After that, she set on to open boutiques, export garments, enter the world of luxury hospitality and open a host of fancy restaurants, one of which was the Tamarind Court in Mehrauli in Delhi. And the Tamarind Court was a restaurant meant for people like Bina herself, the glitterati of New Delhi, the sons and daughters of politicians, international ambassadors, the nieces and nephews of Bollywood actors and actresses. And Thursday, the 29th of April 1999 was a special night in that regard. In fact, on every Thursday, Tamarind Court was the bar in Delhi to be seen in because they hosted their special Thursday night party where alcohol flowed through the veins of the restaurant like water. Just to understand the gravity of who was partying there that night, there were fashion designers Rohit Bal and Tarun Tehlani, Hollywood actor Steven Seagal. What the hell was he doing? So in many Delhi? people are, and it gets crazier. Vice President of Apollo Tires Neeraj Kamar, Abhishek Bachchan's sister-in-law Natasha Nanda, President <laughs> of the Confederation of Indian Industries Rajesh Shah, art dealers Rohini Sharma and Ritu Valya, Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister's son Nakul Nath, and heir to the Bombay Dying Empire Jay Vadia, and the list went on and Ooh. on and on. But the Tamarind Court did not have a liquor license yet. Bina Ramani had applied for a license but it hadn't been granted. All alcohol being served on the premises that night was being sold and served illegally. But there is a simple workaround to serving alcohol at an establishment without a license. You just call it a private party. Bina Ramani's then husband was about to leave for Canada that week and she set up this party as a goodbye for him. This is what every bartender and server and guard that night was asked to do. Call it a private party. And by every standard, the restaurant and bar operated that night like any other. It was no private party. The question is though, did a bar serving people like the ones I mentioned above even need a liquor license? And the answer is, it did not. It's a rather small crime with a fine of rupees 2000 in 1999 money, but it exposes an attitude towards running a business, an attitude that lacks integrity towards a business where one of India's most gut-wrenching murders was about to take place. Now, for a party of this nature, the bartenders and servers for the night needed to match the crowd. And so it was no surprise that behind the bar counter and serving that Thursday night were some of Delhi's prettiest and most up-and-coming models, one of whom was 34-year-old Jessica Lal. Dressed in a white shirt, knotted at the front and denim shorts, Jessica looked just as beautiful as she did in a white and red sari with a bindi on her forehead. Jessica actually got this bartending gig because she was friends with Bina Ramani's daughter, who was also a model with Jessica, Malini Ramani. For that night, it was Jessica and up-and-coming actor and model Cheyenne Munshi who were bartending. While Jessica was behind the bar counter that night pouring away drinks for the who's who of the country, the cause of her demise was getting ready to arrive at the Tamarind Court. Manu Sharma, the 24-year-old son of former Union Minister and Indian National Congress member Vinod Sharma, had been a regular at the Tamarind Court in the past. And this Thursday night, he had every plan of visiting again. He was supposed to get on a train to Chandigarh with his mother, but instead decided to stay back and party the night away with friends. According to an article in the India Today, at 10pm, Manu Sharma drove to the Friends Colony house of Amrinder Singh Gill, the 32-year-old general manager of the Coca-Cola unit in Delhi. At Gill's house, Manu met two other men, one of Gill's colleagues from Coca-Cola, a 30-year-old man named Alok Khanna and Vikas Yadav, son of Rajya Sabha member D.P. Yadav. The men had decided to pre-game, as we call it today, before they made their way to the Tamarind Court party. Now, the India Today article distinguishes between these four men in one very important way, on the basis of their background. Two of these men, Gil and Khanna, were your regular upper-middle-class South Delhi boys working a corporate job at Coca-Cola. They enjoyed their parties and their drinks, but honestly, who at their age doesn't? Colleagues describe them as highly professional and nice guys. The other two, however, Manu Sharma and Vikas Yadav, were political brats. They didn't shy away from the fact that they enjoyed living on the edge. They enjoyed skirting the rules and they enjoyed flaunting the power that came from the political backgrounds they were born into. Manu was open about his love for cars and guns and was described by multiple people as a young man who couldn't hold his drinks. 
That night, the men downed a few drinks before finally leaving for the Tamarind Court at around 10.45 in two separate cars. By 11.15pm, the men had arrived. Little did Jessica know that walking through the doors of a bar full of life and fun was the reason she would never wake up to see another day. At the bar, the men began drinking again and slowly but surely, they got more and more drunk. Now, the bar was supposed to close at 12.30. The seating would still remain open, but no alcohol was to be served after that time. But that was a particularly busy night and the bar ran out of alcohol by 12. Person after person went over to the bar asking for drinks, but every time they got the same answer, the bar is closed. And slowly, people started to leave. Now, it was 2 a.m. The restaurant wasn't as full as it was at 11, but enough people still stuck around. It was at 2 a.m. that a drunk and sloshed Manu Sharma made his way to the bar and asked Jessica for another drink. Like everyone else, he too was told, the bar is closed. But unlike the others that night, a no was not enough for Manu. He offered to pay Jessica 1,000 rupees for just one more drink. But Jessica replied, I won't even give you a sip if you give me a thousand bucks. Can I have a sip of you for a thousand bucks? Responded Manu. An infuriated Jessica asked Manu to get out of the establishment. But this was a blow to Manu's ego. In his own words, it was embarrassing to hear that even if I paid a thousand bucks, I couldn't get a sip of a drink. So embarrassing. What a blow to the ego. Yeah, to, to be, be told denied that you drink. can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can, what an inflated guy. ego you must have to feel that way. <laughs> been coddled your entire life, you know, by people who have just blown smoke up your ass. That right. you think being denied a drink. At a bar that's closed. That doesn't yeah. have alcohol. Like, yeah. She's going to make ethanol for you out of nowhere. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aryan's right. They sound like the words of an entitled young man whose father's money had afforded him a yes for everything he ever wanted. For the first time, someone had said no. A woman had said no. Manu no longer felt strong the way he was used to in his everyday life and he needed to change that. He took out from a holster attached to his belt a .22mm pistol to scare her. It's a toy, someone shouted in the background as a joke. Slowly growing angrier, Manu pointed the gun and fired a shot. His gun was no toy. He asked Jessica for a drink once again. Yet again, she said no. Now he was pointing the gun straight at her and asked her for a drink again. Yet again, she said no. He said he intended to point the gun slightly to her left so that the bullet would go right past her. But when Manu pulled the trigger after that final no, Jessica fell to the ground and suddenly... All one could see on the floor was blood. The bullet had gone straight through her temple. Her death was almost certain. Not everyone immediately realized what had just happened. Eyewitnesses say that the music didn't stop immediately. It died down slowly as more and more people rushed to the bleeding Jessica. So the first shot he fired, the sort of... Was uh, up in the air. Was up in the air. Yeah. But that didn't get people running and scrambling everywhere? No, no, it didn't. So that that does mean, that can mean one of two things, right? Either it was normal or they actually couldn't hear... Couldn't couldn't hear the sound. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Fashion designer Rohit Bal rushed to Jessica as people pulled out their cell phones and began calling ambulances and the police. It was 20 minutes after being shot that Jessica was taken to the Apollo Hospital in the car of Sanjay Mehtani, a Hong Kong-based businessman. While Jessica was being attended to, Bina Ramani, the hostess of the party, had arrived at the scene. She walked up to a drunk Manu in a frenzy and said, Where is the gun? Who are you? Why did you shoot Jessica? But Manu was not panicking. He wasn't crying, he wasn't hysterical, and he wasn't running away just yet. In a calm voice, he said, quote, I haven't done anything, end quote. Bina hadn't seen Jessica get shot, so for a moment there, she thought she had spotted the wrong man. The three friends that Manu had come with, Gil, Khanna and Yadav, got into one of the two cars they came in and went back to Gil's house, where they had started their night. At around 3 a.m., Manu arrived there in the other car, having dropped his pistol off at some random isolated spot in Delhi. Now, this is not surprising, unfortunately, but all four men were figuring out how to get Manu out of this situation. The four men then met with a fifth friend who had come to Delhi from the US. This fifth friend helped the men find the pistol that Manu had disposed of and he took it with him. 
before the cops could figure out the role of this other friend in tampering with evidence and helping a murderer escond he returned to the us the police never found the revolver used to shoot and kill jessica lal while the men were doing that pina had driven to the hospital where a bleeding jessica was taken into the emergency room from the hospital jessica's sister sabrina was called and asked to come over immediately in an interview with the humans of bombay sabrina described that night that summer she got a job as a bartender at the tamarind court to make money on the side it was 1999 my friend and i just set up a travel company on the 30th of april shona dropped by my new office to wish me luck and invited me to the tamarind court but i had too much work before leaving shona said i'll be flying to dubai soon you'll regret not coming tonight i laughed it off saying maybe tomorrow At half past 12 that night I got a call on my office landline saying come to the hospital immediately Shona's hurt still I didn't take it seriously did she twist her ankle or something I asked then the voice on the other end uttered the words that forever changed my life your sister Jessica Lal has been shot I felt the earth slip from under my feet there are things you only see and hear in the movies before I could come to terms my friend called for a cab We rushed to the hospital. There was panic in the air. The police, Delhi stop socialized journalists were all at the hospital. End quote. Sabrina reveals that that night, Shyan Munshi, the bartender with Jessica, broke down in front of her and revealed the details of what he had seen. He said he had seen Manu Sharma shoot Jessica after the fight. The fact that Shyan revealed this to Sabrina is important, and I want you to keep this detail in the back of your mind. Now a lot of accusations have been levied against Bina over what she was doing while Jessica was lying in the hospital. Many have come forward to say that Bina was busy engaging in some rather useless damage control because she was serving alcohol illegally. According to the India Today article, DCP Sudhir Yadav came forward to say that quote Surinder Gharwali, a waiter at the party that night, was specifically asked by the Ramanis to clean the place so that the blood stains from Jessica's body could be removed quickly. End quote. Bina even today denies ever giving that order. Quote her one line instruction to all of us after the shooting was to get your story straight. It was a private party and no liquor was sold. Said cosmetologist Rubina Sharma who was at the party that night. According to Jessica's sister Sabrina, when a witness to the shooting was giving a description of Manu to the cops, Bina quote intimidated this young man who was giving a description of the killers as if she was protecting her son or a relative. Bina told him be careful about what you say you don't know what you could be up against these are dangerous gun toting politicos end quote regardless of these charges against bina though at this point jessica was still alive her sister her parents her friends including people from the party all waited outside in the hope that she would recover in the hope that she would live to tell the tale of that night and fight for justice herself But on the 30th of April 1999 the day she was brought into the hospital she was declared dead the worth of her life was determined by the rich and spoiled it was worth a cheap drink from an illegally run bar in a world where money talks and power rules as the india today article points out manu wasn't doing something unusual he was only mirroring what he had grown up seeing around him you could replace manu with one of thousands of political children in india and jessica with one of millions of models trying to make a mark we'd get ourselves the same case with different names and a different venue now jessica lal was dead and her sister sabrina had taken it upon herself to bring her sister justice but justice how the perpetrator of this crime manu sharma and his three accomplices were all on the run In fact even Manu's family was hiding none of them could be reached by the cops despite being high flying political officials but in helping the cops find Manu Bina Ramani's husband George Melot gave the police the number of Manu's car his Tata Safari using this number the police located the car abandoned in Noida in Uttar Pradesh but Manu was still nowhere to be found however 4 days after the murder the police apprehended and arrested Khanna and Gill Using them the police eventually found Manu Sharma a week after the murder hiding in Himachal Pradesh. Despite being caught though Manu remained as calm and composed as he did the night he had shot Jessica. I did nothing. Yes, I am innocent. I don't care for what anyone presumes. 
by may 8th 11 other men accused of being manu's accomplices and helping him run away including vikas yadav who were there that night were arrested soon after bina ramani her husband george and her daughter malini ramani were all arrested on charges of running an illegal bar for tampering with evidence by ordering the staff to clean up the crime scene and for running a restaurant in india to begin with despite being british citizens that that restaurant was like yeah, all hot in spot all like there was nothing like petty administratively stupidity administratively right yeah. happening yeah For a moment there it seemed like justice might be served after all so many people saw a murder take place in a public setting at least one was going to come forward and tell the truth in fact one had come forward and agreed to tell the truth Shine Munshi the upcoming Bollywood actor who was bartending with Jessica that night and had witnessed the entire incident unfold right in front of his eyes By the 3rd of August 1999, 3 months after the murder, charge sheets were finally filed with the court. Manu Sharma was charged with murder and destruction of evidence, while his accomplices were charged with destruction of evidence, conspiracy and harboring a suspect. Manu Sharma was being represented by none other than one of India's most prolific yet controversial lawyers, Ram Jeet Malani, who throughout his career defended Indira Gandhi's assassins, Asaram Bapu and underworld don Haji Mastan. Shara, uh, you were there when uh, we went for the the Mayo College Mayo debate, College debate yeah. one of India's most pre- prestigious national debates. Yeah. He was the chief guest. Yours truly won the best debater He in did. the country. Yeah. And Ramjit Milani gave me his, his signed book. autobiography. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you feel shitty about that book now? Yeah, yeah, I feel shitty about winning that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. The trial began with 32 witnesses who were supposed to come forward and testify to watching Manu pull the trigger at Jessica. These witnesses had been interviewed and interrogated by the cops in the run up to the trial. They had all given statements claiming they had watched the murder take place or had information regarding it that would implicate Manu. These witnesses included Shyan Munshi and two ballistics experts who were supposed to show that the two shots fired that night, one in the air and the other at Jessica, were fired by the same gun. Yet one by one by one as prosecution called the witnesses to the stand each of them told the court the same story they had either left the party before the trigger was ever pulled or they were on the terrace and didn't come down until jessica was already shot all 32 of the witnesses that the prosecution had lined up including the ballistic experts had turned hostile they had changed their stories and claimed that their original statements to the cops were made under coercion sabrina told the humans of bombay quote i tried persuading the three primary witnesses to testify honestly one of them an electrician said quote they'll kill my family if i do manu sharma's father got to him The other guy agreed to testify if I supported him financially. I knew he was playing both sides, but I gave in. But I trusted Shyan. He was affluent and Jessica's friend. But then even he started avoiding me. Still I had faith in the judicial system. I thought, what if these three don't testify? There were 100 others at the bar. But all the witnesses turned hostile. Mostly the excuse was I left the party before 12 a.m. End quote. Finally on the 3rd of May 2001 Shyan testified he failed to recognize Manu Sharma end quote Can I ask you something honestly Yeah um what do you think if you were there at that bar that day what would you have done I think it's easy to say that you would come forward and tell the truth when you have terror yeah. of being killed your family yeah. being killed that is very real However this is a failure obviously at some level I don't think it's necessarily an individual level failure I yeah. think it's a failure of the system It's a prisoner's paradox kind of thing yeah. right that yeah. if you tell the truth mm-hmm. everybody else lies mm-hmm. A she's still going to be indicted Yeah and B I mean most of these people they'll be ostracized from the Bollywood fraternity right. altogether yeah. for fessing up to something like this I agree with that that to me I think is a is a moral failure if that's your reason yeah i mean but but i think the failure is on part of the government for not having enough witness protection i think that's the real failure you know i i fully agree with you i think you can boil it down to something systemic mm-hmm. but at the end of the day there are people who in moments of systemic failures mm-hmm. show individual bravado right none of the 100 but that's really show. hard it's really yeah. hard and rare but 
I mean, I would have thought one of the hundred would have. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't seem to be the case. No, I think there is moral failure for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But clearly, Sabrina's faith was unfounded. Shai and Munshi turned the courtroom into a joke when he suddenly began to claim he doesn't understand Hindi at all and requested to be asked all the questions in English What instead. Bullshit. He said that to prove to the court that his original statements to the court shouldn't be considered since he never understood what the cops were asking him to begin with. If I see this guy act in a Bollywood movie ever, he has acted in Bollywood movies and okay. spoken Hindi. And sp- hmm, actually, I don't know. I haven't watched Probably, his movies. Probably, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How were you? So we're what gonna a, get what to this again. Course, yeah. Yeah, this is BS. We're going to get to Shyan again and his Hindi claims once yeah. more. Now like Aran picked up on Shyan's bullshit, the courts weren't stupid and neither were the people following the trial. What happened in this case was obvious. Manu Sharma and his politically powerful family had managed to reach the witnesses since there was no witness protection. They had scared the witnesses or paid them off to tell a story that would get Manu out of jail. But even though this reality was plainly obvious to the courts and the people, the fact of the matter was that the prosecution now had zero witnesses. In a bar full of people, not one had seen Jessica be murdered. The questioning of the witnesses and the back and forth over the witnesses turning hostile went on for 7 years. And then on the 21st of February 2006, 9 of the 12 accused in the murder and in helping Manu were acquitted. They were free men with no charges against them. It was in the year 2006, a day after the courts let 9 out of the 12 men free, that the Times of India printed the story with a gut-wrenching headline. No one killed Jessica. And you know who was one of the nine who was freed by the courts? Manu Sharma, the man who pulled the trigger. Who were the other three who weren't set free? One of them was a man who had been discharged years ago, so he was already free. The others were two men the cops were never able to catch at all. So basically the verdict was this. Manu and his 11 accomplices had nothing to do with Jessica's murder. The official court document said the following. The court has acquitted them because the Delhi police failed to sustain the grounds on which they had built up their case. The police failed to recover the weapon which was used to fire at Jessica Lal as well as prove their theory that the two cartridges emptied shells of which were recovered from the spot were fired from one weapon. End quote. Now it's perfectly fair if you're asking if Manu Sharma was actually innocent. After all, 32 witnesses turning hostile is no ordinary deal. This country has seen only a few cases of such gross witness tampering. What if all of these people changed their story because their new story was the actual truth? What if the police did force the original statements out of them? The police doing that is not unheard of. If you're asking that, I'm proud of you and you're a true crime junkie. But I have your answers. The Helka used to be a once famous investigative journalistic magazine, famous for its sting operations. And one of its most incredible and jaw-dropping sting operations was conducted in 2006 after the trial was over on none other than Shyan Munshi, the bartender and star witness against Manu Sharma. A Thelka journalist pretended to be a UK-based company wanting to cast a bilingual actor for a bilingual movie. In the sting operation video, Shyan Munshi can be seen bragging about his Hindi and Urdu bilingual proficiency and even claiming that he learned Hindi while he was in school, clearly proving that his entire I don't understand Hindi ploy in the courtroom was merely a method to distract, divert and delay justice. In fact, in the interview, the undercover journalist mentioned the trial and Manu Sharma to Shyan. The reporter said, quote, "The world knows it's Manu Sharma, right?" Shyan responded by saying then why is the world not doing anything about it why is everyone beating around the bush these are powerful people end quote now justifiably so the cops were agitated they had been made a fool of in open court they had been given statements all of which now looked false their credibility had been tarnished and so it was the police who petitioned the high court for a review of the case and on the 22nd of march 2006 the court issued warrants against the nine defendants who had stood trial all nine of them were again set free on bail with the condition that they couldn't leave the country but then on the 15th of december 2006 the high court came back with a ruling after considering the journalistic work done by the tehelka interviews They declared Manu Sharma guilty of murder and even went so far as to criticize the original judge in the case S L Bhayana. 
In fact, it was the outcry after the Tehelka videos that led Manu Sharma's father, Vinod Sharma, to resign from the Haryana cabinet. Manu Sharma was punished with life imprisonment while his accomplices Yadav and Gil were given four years behind bars. A plea for Sharma to be sentenced to death was rejected on the grounds that the murder, although intentional, was not premeditated and Sharma was not considered to be a threat to society. Then, in February of 2011, 12 years after Jessica's murder, all 32 witnesses who had changed their stories faced charges of perjury, a huge victory in the case. According to the Indian Express, in May 2013, Delhi High Court ordered prosecution of Bollywood actor Shyam Munshi and ballistics expert P.S. Manocha for turning hostile. The court cleared a further 17 people whose allegedly hostile position was under review. 10 other people had been discharged from claims of perjury in earlier hearings and 3 had died since the original trial. End quote. Then in 2020, 19 years after the murder, Manu Sharma was released from prison on account of good behavior. Once released, Manu was interviewed by the Hindustan Times and he had this to say to the world and to Jessica's family. Going to jail is one of the most difficult and scary things that can happen to anyone. I was 23 years old and going about work and life. And one day I suddenly woke up to the clanging sound of iron gates for a roll call at 5 a.m. I found myself hauled up and paraded for a head count. The most difficult task of the day was probably using the toilets since there are just 5 toilets for more than 500 inmates. A bucket of water was a luxury. You face a number of hardships in Tihar, but in time you learn to live with them. I was a young 23-year-old boy. I never intended anyone any harm and I'm very sorry for what happened. During this time, the toughest part by far was seeing my parents suffer. I feel the suffering I faced was nothing compared to what I saw in their eyes. I feel really sorry for what they had to go through for no fault of theirs. I'm really thankful to God that their ordeal has come to an end after 21 long years. I have no words to express my sincere gratitude to Sabrina and her family. I am deeply sorry for the pain I have caused them. I am eternally grateful for their magnanimity. End quote. When asked what would you say to a young Manu Sharma of 1999, what would you tell him about life? He said, "Life can change in a minute. Don't take anything for granted." Upon Manu's release, Sabrina came forward to say she forgave Manu. She had no objections to him being released and that she was rejecting the compensation that Tihar jail was offering to her but she did miss her sister deeply and even decades later she said quote she was jovial and positive in life it is not just on birthdays and death anniversaries that i miss her it is every day i have lots of pictures of her in my home and not that i need them to miss her but they are there to remind me of her end quote Shortly after Manu's release, Jessica and Sabrina's mother died after a long battle with cancer. Then, a few months later, their father died after having multiple strokes. Sabrina says Manu killed not only Jessica but wiped out half her family. Manu has since gone on to get married to Preeti Sharma, a Mumbai-based model whom he had been long-time friends with. Bina Ramani, her husband and her daughter Malini were soon released after their arrest although they surrendered their passports for a while. They were never charged with suppressing or tampering with evidence, the penalty for which can go up to life imprisonment under section 201 of the Indian Penal Code. Bina Ramani now admits to running her bars illegally after denying the claim for many years. I told a partial lie. I know there's a penalty for selling unlicensed booze and I'm prepared for it. It wasn't such an important issue at that time. I'm not trying to pass the buck, but everyone is bending the law because it is outdated. In 2021, a year after Manu's release, Jessica's younger sister, the one person who fought for her justice for 21 years straight, passed away at the age of 53 of organ failure. She had been unwell for a while now, but to Jessica's family, there was some peace in knowing that perhaps in some version of reality, in some version of this world, the two sisters, the two best friends are now united.